Uh, thanks, Ian. Um, uh, it's great to be here visiting at the Institute. I'm having a really, really nice time. It's a wonderful place to, to spend some time. Um, and thanks for the invitation to speak. Uh, so let me uh, actually I'll write it here. Oh, it's kind of wet still. Um, so I'm going to talk about proper affine actions uh, of right angled uh, Coxeter groups. Um, and this is joint work with Francois Garito uh, and Fanny Castle. Uh, Castle. Okay. Um, okay. So what this is about is um, uh, complete affine manifolds and orbifolds, and the. Um, particular the, the, the group actions that we use to, to construct such, such manifolds and orbifolds. So let me introduce uh, the affine group. Okay, so aff of Rn uh, will denote um, it's just the group of, of affine transformations of Rn. It's the it's all um, maps from Rn to Rn of the form uh, x goes to uh, Ax plus b, um, where A is just a, a linear, an invertible linear transformation, so just an n by n invertible matrix. Uh, and b is a translation vector. OK, so this. This A is called the linear part, and B is called the, the translational part. OK, so these are just the transformations that I think we all learned about as young children. You can just sort of can rotate things, translate them, skew, sort of stretch and squeeze, um, just, just affine transformations. OK, so of course, the affine group is a semi-direct product. Okay, um, of the linear transformations uh, with the um, translations, uh, with the usual action of of linear maps on R n. Okay, so today I want to study uh, what are called proper affine actions. OK, what is this? So this is the uh, a proper affine action is a, is a discrete group gamma uh, uh, sorry, a representation of gamma into the affine group uh, such that the action of gamma on Rn determined by this representation is properly discontinuous. Okay, um, and uh, this is exactly the type of action that you need uh, so that the quotient uh, by this action is a uh, manifold or or an orbifold. Uh, it's exactly the, the type of, of dynamics so that you know you can take a nice quotient, a nice Hausdorff quotient. Um, and such a such a you know it's it's not just a topological manifold; it's a um, it's endowed with with, uh, uh, with 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 an affine structure. It actually has a, a flat a flat affine connection, um, uh, which is complete um, under its its uh, geodesic flow. Um, so these things are called complete. Complete affine uh, manifolds or, or, or orbifolds. Okay, so um, I want to talk real quickly about a few examples that you guys have probably 
uh, already thought about. Um, so examples. Um, so let me try to find this part. Okay. Um, okay. So first of all. A nice subgroup of the group is just the group of Euclidean transformations of Rn. So any Euclidean, uh, complete Euclidean manifold or orbifold is also a, um, an example of such a, a complete affine manifold. Um, so for example, uh, uh, just a, a, a lattice of translations acting on Rn um, is a nice properly discontinuous affine action. Um, and in fact, uh, all actions, all proper actions uh, or discrete actions by Euclidean transformations uh, are virtually abelian. The, the types of groups that act in Euclidean geometry are, are relatively boring. They're all up to finite index, just abelian, abelian groups. OK. Um, cool. Uh, OK, so if we're allowed to use um, sort of more interesting uh, affine transformations, um, can we make more complicated group actions? And the answer is yes. So uh, there are plenty of examples where gamma is nilpotent. Um, for example, if you take the integer Heisenberg group acting on the real Heisenberg group, um, you know you can think of this not as a group but as a as a space, as just a copy of R three. And it's easy to realize this action um, uh, as affine transformation. So this is this is a nice uh, complete affine manifold with with no potent fundamental group. Um, and more generally, there are many examples of gamma solvable. Um, uh, so, for example, um, in again in n equals three, any Sol geometry structure. So any any three manifold that emits a Sol geometry structure emits an affine, uh, a complete affine structure as well. This, in fact, Sol geometry can be realized as a subgeometry of, of affine geometry. So, for example, uh, the mapping torus of an Anosov uh, diffeomorphism of the torus um, has a, a complete affine structure on it. Okay, um, now. So there's a famous conjecture about these things, um, which is attributed to Auslander from 1964. Um, and roughly, it's a conjectural generalization of the of the Bieberbach theorem about um, co-compact Euclidean actions. Um, in that setting, a co-compact Euclidean action is is virtually <laughs> virtually a torus, virtually just a lattice of translations, like this. Um, in this setting, as we see, we need to allow something a little more complicated. The conjecture says that, um, let's see, how do I want to say it? Um, if an affine action, gamma uh, on Rn, um, is both proper and co-compact, uh, then uh, gamma as an abstract group is, is virtually solvable. OK, so up to finite index, it's just a solvable group um, you know, landing in category uh, three here. Um, or, you know, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, right. So, so in this setting, uh, what virtually solvable uh, means is just that the gamma does not contain a copy of the free of the non-abelian free group um, of some rank r greater than or equal to two. Okay, so the conjecture essentially is saying if you have a proper affine action that is also co-compact. And it's got to be a pretty small group. You can't fit a free group inside of that inside of that group. Okay, um, right. 
So you could, try to, you could try to prove this conjecture by just proving that free groups can't act properly discontinuously by affine transformations. And I think that was sort of what people expected to, to happen. Um, but that won't work because Margulis in 83 uh, showed that there do exist uh, proper affine actions of non-abelian free groups um, on R3. Um, okay, so um, even though affine geometry is flat and it doesn't seem like it's big enough to admit free group actions, somehow it really does. Um, and uh, you know, since Margulis discovered these examples, um, many people have, have uh, studied these free group actions. Let me just write a few. Uh, Choi, uh, Charette, Drum, uh, Goldman, uh, Labory, and others, including myself and, and my collaborators, um, to try to understand like what, what is the geometry of these actions? What is the topology of the quotient manifold? Um, What's the sort of moduli of, of, of these free group actions? How many different ways to do this are there? Um, OK. And uh, let me just mention, um, in higher dimension, uh, for free groups um, acting in higher dimensions, uh, Abels, Margulis, and Seufer, and uh, Recently, uh, Smilga have studied different ways to make free groups act properly um, in, in, uh, on some Rn uh, by affine transformations. OK. Um, let's see. So I guess I should write this over here. So um, of course, these free group actions are not a counterexample to the Auslander conjecture because they're not co-compact, right? Somehow, to, to fit the free group in affine space, uh, you need at least uh, a three-dimensional affine space. And um, of course, so let me put this in parentheses. Of course, R3 uh, well, the free group is not compact. It's not going to be compact. And why is that? Anybody? We have tons of three manifold topologists in the room. Okay. Um, what's that? Irreducible. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there are no spheres in this thing. So, yeah, the universal covers R3. The fundamental group is a free group. Free group is not big enough to be the fundamental group of a, you know, whatever, irreducible, aspherical uh, three manifold. Um, it just doesn't, it's just not of large enough dimension. The virtual cohomological dimension of the free group is one. Um, and since the universal cover of such a manifold is R3, the, the cohomology of the manifold is described by the cohomology of its fundamental group. Um, but that's impossible if this were, um, if, there, if this were truly compact. So, so one is less than three is the proof that uh, this can't ever be uh, co-compact. OK, so, well, um, OK, and then I should say, I should say, uh, really trying to build up the main theorem here, I guess. Um, <laughs> I should say that other than these free group examples, ver essentially no examples of non solvable groups um, are known, other than uh, which act properly by affine transformations are known. I mean, you could take a free group and take products with some free groups and some. Uh, you know, solvable groups and make something, but um, but essentially there are no uh, no interesting uh, proper affine actions known about um, of high cohomological dimension. So the natural question is, okay, maybe it's too hard to make something co-compact, but let's just start by trying to make proper affine actions by discrete groups that are um, not products of solvable and free groups, which have high uh, high dimension, and that's. Uh, that's what this, uh, the main result is about.
So um, uh, any uh, right angled And which uh, henceforth will be abbrevi abbreviated R A C G uh, uh, admits a proper affine action on R N, uh, where N is K times K minus one over two, um, and K is the number of generators uh, of the Coxeter group. OK, so in particular, um, so this, OK, let me, let me say this gives, you know, there's been a lot of um, buzz, there's a lot of interest in, in right angle Coxeter groups um, because, as it turns out, they, they contain all sorts of, of exciting groups. Um, so corollary, uh, we get. Uh, let me say there exist proper affine actions of uh, surface groups, for example. So the fundamental group of a closed surface. Uh, hyperbolic three manifold groups. OK, that uses the fact that those are now known to be virtually special. Um, from, from Ian's, Ian's work. Um, and more generally, uh, hyperbolic groups, so Gromov hyperbolic groups, groups of arbitrary, arbitrarily high uh, virtual cohomological dimension. Um, so this uses, I have to look at the names here, uh, work of uh, Janis Skevich. Um, uh, Janis Kavich and um, uh, uh, Sviatkowski, um, which kind of surprisingly they showed that there are right angle Coxeter groups which are both hyperbolic and, and can have arbitrary dimension. Um, okay, so, so the the moral is um, I'm going to show you a new way to make lots of interesting proper affine actions of very complicated groups. Uh, they, again, won't be anywhere close to being co-compact, just like these. Um, but it's at least an indication that, uh, that if you're going to work on this conjecture, if you're just going to look for interesting affine manifolds, there might be a lot out there to, to consider. OK, um, great. So uh, where should I go next? Let's see. Um, I think I'm going to erase this. OK. OK. Yeah, I could, um, right. So, for example, um, by a similar argument, I mean the the the, uh, the sort of dimension of the affine space here is is quadratic in the number of generators, but the the dimension of of a Coxeter group on K generators can't be bigger than K. Usually, it'll be a lot less than K. Yeah. So these are these are you know they're they're not co-compact in a sense you know they're. As you, as you increase k, they're getting farther and farther away from being co-compact. Um, and yeah, I mean, a, an interesting question would be, you know, how small can you make the co-dimension between uh, of a discrete group and its and the affine space that it can that it can act on um, when it's not virtually solvable? It, yeah. Like I said, there were before this, other than free groups, there was essentially no examples known of of any interesting uh, actions. Um, well, or, you know, by complicated groups. OK. Uh, other questions? OK, so um, actually, if I, if I write here, can you guys see? Yeah? Yes? 
Um, okay, so at risk of boring you, um, what is a right angled Coxeter group? Well, it's a group, I'll call it W, because that's what they call it in, in like Davis's book, I guess. Um, so it's generated by uh, K, uh, let's say K generators. Let's see. Um, and all of those generators uh, have order two. Okay. Um, and then for each i not equal to j, we get it to choose uh, either gamma i, gamma j commute, or there's no relation between the two. Okay, so essentially you take uh, k generators um, and you just uh, decide that some of them will commute and that some of them will not commute. Um, and you get what's called a right angle Coxeter group. Okay, so um, okay, so a simple example, um, which we'll use as kind of a prototype, uh, is the following. It's generated by three uh, elements. Um, okay, and um, let's just throw in one relate one extra uh, relation that that gamma one and gamma three commute, but gamma two and gamma one do not commute, and uh, gamma three and gamma two do not commute either. Okay, so um, so a right angle Coxeter group you know, is supposed to be an, an abstract version of just a a reflection orbifold, right? You're supposed to be thinking that such a group comes by uh, by taking the reflections in some uh, right-angled polytope and generating some sort of uh, some sort of uh, discrete orbifold group like that. Um, and this one does, in fact, uh, is in fact realized that way. Uh, so here's a picture of the hyperbolic plane. Um, and I'm going to think of it as in the projective model. So it's a, it's a round disk inside of RP2. OK, and I can actually realize, uh, I can realize this group um, as the reflections in a, in a partially hyper-ideal triangle. OK, so um, let's see. Uh, OK, so here's two sides of the triangle. They meet at right angles. And then here's a third side okay so this is this is a try if you if you just look at the part of this triangle that's inside the hyperbolic plane it's got two sides that meet and then a third side that doesn't meet either of the first two sides okay and how do I realize this reflection group well I just take the reflections in this triangle so I'm going to take um, gamma 1 to reflect in this side gamma 3 will reflect in that side and then gamma 2 uh, will reflect in this side. And you see that this right angle here makes it the case that the, that the relation uh, is satisfied. Because if I reflect using gamma 1, and then I uh, reflect using gamma 3, um, that's the same as first reflecting using gamma 3 and then reflecting using gamma 1. It gets to the same, the same tile. OK. So um, right, and I'm going to refer to this. I want to actually consider the entire triangle here in, in RP2. I'm going to refer to that as, as delta. And it translates, I'm going I'm to refer to it as tiles frequently, because you know, think of this as a nice tiling of, of hyperbolic space. OK. So, uh, so what did I just do? I constructed a representation. Uh, uh, representation rho uh, from my Coxeter group W into the isometry group of the hyperbolic plane, which is O21. Right? Simply by realizing the group as generated by reflections in this in this natural right angled uh, polytope living in, in hyperbolic space. Okay? So that's great. Um, 
I actually have a lot of freedom in this construction, right? Um, there are many representations of this Coxeter group into O21. So how do I find those? Well, um, what's the what freedom do I have? Well, I can I can uh, since this wall since this this side doesn't meet uh, say this one, uh, there's some distance in the hyperbolic plane. That's actually a perpendicular distance, um, which I'll call d12, that describes how far apart the first side and the second side are. And then there's another distance, d23, um, that describes how far apart, uh, that, that tells you how, how far apart these two sides are. And I can, I can adjust those parameters to be anything I want, right? So. So um, you get a two-parameter family, really, of non-conjugate representations parameterized by this vector of, of uh, distances. OK. Uh, great. So why am I telling you about that? Well, it turns out that there's a really nice way to <clears throat> construct a lot of affine actions um, from deformations of discrete subgroups of Lie groups. So let me try to fit this all on this board here. Um, let's see, is that going to happen? Yeah. OK, so um, all right. So definition, uh, an infinitesimal deformation of, um, so let's let rho be a discrete discrete embedding of some discrete group gamma into a uh, semi-simple Lie group. Um, let me write that, g semi-simple. And let's, uh, it doesn't matter, but for this discussion, we could assume it has a trivial center. Um, let me just introduce the notation. Frac g will be the Lie algebra of g, OK? So an infinitesimal deformation of this guy is a lift of our discrete embedding up to the tangent bundle of G. Okay, it's exactly what you think it is. You just assign to each point of the group here a tangent vector so that the group laws still hold to first order um, and the relations still hold to first order. It's just a just a formal infinitesimal deformation. Okay. So observe now. Um, that the tangent bundle of G is a direct product of G with its Lie algebra, right? Uh, twisted by the adjoint action. So it's naturally it's naturally a subgroup of the general linear group um, on the Lie algebra, just thought of as a vector space. Um, Semi-direct uh, the Lie algebra. Okay. And that, uh, you should recognize, as just the affine group of the Lie algebra. So now on the right-hand side here, I'm, I'm not thinking of the Lie algebra as a, as a Lie algebra anymore. I'm just thinking of it as a copy of Rn. Um, uh, and it has some group of affine transformations. And we can actually think of the tangent bundle of G as, as giving us uh, affine transformations. OK, so it's just as a formal, uh, a formal algebraic uh, you know, trick, I guess. Um, so let's just introduce some notation here. So phi, this lift to the to the tangent bundle, we can think of as well in this semi-direct product. Um, it's really just the discrete embedding row that we started with, and a function um, u from gamma into g, which is. Uh, a row cocycle. It's a it's a, not a homomorphism, but it's a twisted homomorphism, twisted by the action, uh, the adjoint action of row. Okay, but essentially this 
this thing, this co-cycle records all of the tangent vectors up here, just sort of translated back to the identity. OK. OK, so from, from an infinitesimal deformation, then, we get an affine action via this, um, you know, this inclusion above. Just like that. Okay, so if we have a reasonably flexible discrete subgroup of a Lie group, we can get lots of affine actions on the Lie algebra of that of that Lie group. Okay, but I should warn you, usually a lot. Well, I don't know. It's hard to say what fraction, but many of those will not be properly discontinuous, right? So, for example, if I just take the trivial deformation u equals zero, so no tangent vectors at all. Um, over here, I'm going to get an affine action that's actually linear, and it's going to fix the origin. It's not proper at all. It's you know every point fixes the origin. So we do get a lot of affine actions, but they may have very complicated dynamics. It's it's hard to tell if they'll act properly. So what we'd really like um, what we'd really like is some some dictionary. It tells us how to look at the geometry of this infinitesimal deformation um, and how to relate that to the dynamics of this, this affine action. Okay, we'd like to be able to say something like, oh, if we deform this discrete uh, subgroup of G in a certain way, um, that will lead to nice properly discontinuous actions over here. Okay, so, so in general, that dictionary is far from. Uh, far from written, um, do you write a dictionary? Uh, whatever, far from determined. Um, but in the case g equals o two one, um, there is uh, there is sort of a complete description of how this how this works. It goes back to the ideas of Margulis and and uh, uh, Goldman Labore Margulis, um, and in this sort of uh, in the, the description I want to tell you about um, myself with, with Fontel Garato and Fanny Castle. Uh, roughly, it says if I take an infinitesimal deformation here, which is contracting in a certain sense, then that should lead to a proper action and vice versa. Okay. Um, so it's kind of vague, but, but let me tell you precisely how that works in the setting of this example. And then we'll, uh, we'll sort of try to repeat that for all right angled Coxeter groups. Um, and some really interesting geometry will, will come up along the way. OK. Um, are there any questions about that? Does it make sense? It's just a, you know, it seems a little funny, but it's just formal algebra. The tangent bundle of Lie group really just is an affine, an affine action. OK. Um, all right, so back to our example. Um, OK. So I'd like to so I'd like to choose a very specific family of these uh, reflection orbifolds. So I'm going to choose the distance d12 and d23 to be equal. And I'll call that some parameter t. OK. And uh, why do I want to do that? Um, well, uh, or let's say, sorry, I don't want to do that. Um, uh, think of it as some constant capital minus t. And we'll, we'll allow t to vary. I want to do that because I want, to, I want a family of, of uh, reflection orbifolds here, which are, which are getting smaller. Um, so that all distances are shrinking. So if I bring this sort of free wall closer to these two walls, I'm making the reflection orbifold smaller. Um, that's the intuition. So I take the derivative. OK. Uh, and that gives me an infinitesimal deformation. Uh, so just rho at time 0, just when the distances are capital D, uh, together with the deformation co-cycle u, which describing how this group is changing. OK. Um, so, 
so u in this case has has uh, values in the Lie algebra of O2 one, and I want to think of those now, and from here on out as killing as killing fields on H two. So vector fields um, whose flow preserves the metric of H two, at least to first order. Okay, so that's exactly what the Lie algebra should be, just infinitesimal isometries, right? Um, okay, so actually in this, so if you, if you evaluate this U on the reflections, the generators, gamma i, this is actually telling you something very concrete. It's just telling you the motion uh, of the ith reflection wall. Okay, so depending on how I choose to realize this deformation, um, maybe I'll use green now. Um, for each of my generators, um, and more generally each uh, sort of conjugate, uh, this is telling you is telling me how I should move this fundamental domain around. So maybe I'm doing this deformation in such a way that these two walls remain fixed, and I just move the second wall uh, inward. Okay, so U literally tells me a vector field um, on all of H2, but if I, if I just look at it on this reflection wall, it's telling me how to push this, this wall closer to make a smaller, uh, a smaller reflection orbifold. Does that make sense? And of course, uh, of course um, it tells me, it gives me directions for moving the walls around uh, in an equivariant way, so these you know, we'll also move this way, like this. And, uh, you know, I sort of avoided trying to draw more, more tiles here, but if I reflect along this face, here's a picture of that tile. It starts to get hard to draw in the, in the Klein model. Um, but since this face is moving towards the origin here, these faces um, also move. They have to move even faster. Right, uh, because these distances have to be shrinking. Okay, so U gives me instructions for how to deform the tiles to get, uh, you know, infinitesimally a, a new a new reflection group, which is a little bit smaller. Does that picture make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. And so what I want to do, uh, yeah. So I, I won't tell you how to do this, but I, I'll claim that we can extend this vector field. It's not really this vector field, but a, a slight perturbation of it. Um, to get a deformation vector field, x, um, uh, whoops, x on the hyperbolic plane. Okay, so really I'm just going to fill in the vector field in each of these tiles in some natural way so that I actually get a deformation of this. Literally, this is, this is what a formal uh, infinitesimal deformation of a, of a reflection orbifold is. It's just a, a vector field on the universal cover that has some equivariance, equivariance properties. So I won't, I won't write that uh, explicitly, um, but let me say uh, it's what's called U equivariant. Um, and some people call that automorphic. Um, and uh, yeah, so it basically, it's, it satisfies the right equivariance property uh, to, to give you a true uh, infinitesimal deformation, uh, not just some random vector field on H2. Okay. Um, and then The claim is, so why did I choose this? Why did I choose these parameters in such a way? Like I said, I want to make the reflection orbifold smaller. So the claim is that this, this vector field is uniformly contracting. Okay, so essentially, I won't write down what that means precisely, but if you have two points, um, P and Q, and you look at the vector field at P and the vector field at Q, relative to one another, under the flow of the vector field, these points are getting closer together at a rate proportional to their distance. Okay, so it's a, 
you know, you can believe that here. You saw these sort of four central tiles are, are shrinking. Every other tile, like this one I drew, is not just shrinking, but it's moving rapidly towards the origin here. So a very far out tile way out here um, is not just shrinking relative to itself, but it's moving very close to the, to the base tile here. Okay, the whole thing is, the whole picture is, is contracting. Okay, um, so now the, the punchline to this basic example is that that contraction tells you exactly why the, the corresponding affine action is proper. Okay. Um, and I, I want to sketch the proof of this um, so that you see how this works. Uh, this affine action, which, you know, we'll think of this uh, as just an action on R3. So identify the Lie algebra of O21 with, with R3 um, is proper. OK, um, proof. OK, so the idea is we want to define a projection from this space, an equivariant projection from this space to some other space where the group is already known to act properly, right? So if you, if you can find an equivariant projection um, to another proper action, that means the action that you started with has to be proper. So how do we do that? Um, OK, so for, for each V, OK, so for each element of the Lie algebra, again, thought of as a, as a killing vector field, uh, we get a new deformation vector field by subtracting V from x. So remember. Uh, field. Remember, there's some choice in how I in how I do this, right? I, I said I want this wall to be at, at distance t from these two walls, and I want it to that distance t to decrease. But of course, I could you know I could move these walls towards that wall instead of moving that wall towards these walls. The whole thing could be slowly rotating or drifting. Um, there's a whole family of, of infinitesimal deformations that essentially do the same thing, and you get those just by adding or subtracting all elements of the Lie algebra. Um, so anyway, I take, I take a killing vector field, I subtract it, I get a new deformation vector field. Because V is isometric, um, X minus V is also uniformly contracting. So what you see is, well, perhaps these tiles that didn't seem to be moving very much are now moving a lot. But somewhere in the picture, um, there's roughly one, two, maybe up to four tiles, which are not moving very much. And the rest are moving, are moving in towards those. So there's, there exists uh, one tile, or maybe a few, um, uh, which I'll denote by uh, you know, rho zero gamma times delta. Um, that moves least uh, under x minus v. Uh, the other ones, all others, uh, move towards, uh, towards this tile. Okay, um, at a rapid pace, depending on how far away they are. So essentially, the picture looks just like this, but you know, centered somewhere else in the tiling. Um, they're sort of tiles that are roughly stable, and the rest of them are, are coming inwards towards that tile um, uh, at a rapid rate. Okay, so this gives us a, a nice coarse projection, right? It gives us a way to associate to an element of our affine space um, an element of this tile, a tile of this tiling, or, or more concretely, an element of, of, the, of W.
Okay, so um, uh, so how does it work? Just send the killing field uh, V to the element gamma corresponding to the tile that doesn't move very much under x minus v. Okay? Um, and that, if you work it out, is uh, nice and equivariant under the affine action. Uh, sorry, how do I want to what do I mean here? It takes the affine action uh, to the action by left multiplication of w on itself. Okay? And the action by left uh, multiplication uh, of a group on itself is, is proper. So uh, therefore, the action, uh, the affine action, uh, is also proper. Right? Essentially, if you have a compact set up here, you project it down here, you get finitely many elements of the group. And the action down here sends those off to infinity. So the compact set you had up here also had to go off to infinity. OK. Uh, that's the proof. OK, so are there any questions about that? I hope that made some sense. Um, you kind of have to trace through some of these, uh, some of these actions. But it's, it's actually a very natural, um, very natural uh, I think, construction, um, at least in, in my opinion. Um, yeah, and in the case of O21, all essentially all proper actions. Uh, uh, in the, sorry, in the case of R3, essentially all proper actions um, of non-solvable groups come in come in this way. You've probably already noticed that secretly, my right-angled Coxeter group here is just a free group, virtually, right? Okay. Okay. Questions about that? Uh, I hope that wasn't too fast. Um, Okay, so let me, in the last 10 minutes, try to tell you how to do this for a general, a general right-angled Coxeter group. Um, okay. Um, So for a general uh, right angle Coxeter group W, remember it's generated by, by K, uh, let's say K generators of order two. Some of them commute, others do not uh, at your whimsy. Um, there's actually a nice, so, so, so what I did here is I made use of this nice two parameter family of, of representations of W, and I use the deformation theory to, to understand some proper actions. Um, so there's actually some nice, there's some nice linear representations of any right angled Coxeter group. Um, uh, going back to, I think this was first described by, by Titz, um, and it was, you know, these things were studied by Vinberg as well. Uh, I've heard recently that there's someone, uh, Kramer, who thought about similar. Uh, families of, of, of representations um, for other purposes, and also uh, uh, Dyer, Holweg, and, and Ripple in uh, 2013 uh, studied some of these things in the setting of Katz-Moody groups, um, some of the geometry of these representations. Okay, so formally, it's, it's, uh, the way we make these representations is very similar. So for each, uh, for each non-commuting pair, uh, gamma i and gamma j, I'm going to choose a, a distance, uh, d i j. Uh, let's let it be greater than 0. You could technically choose it to be 0, but um, that's 
this DIJ is meant to be the, the distance between the two reflection walls of some polytope um, uh, uh, corresponding to the, uh, the non, these non-commuting generators. So there's some distance apart. Um, OK, so I, cho I just choose these parameters. And I can formally construct a bilinear form, a symmetric bilinear form, B, which depends on all these choices, uh, on RK. Um, OK. Uh, and and using that bilinear form, I can I can construct uh, construct a representation of my Coxeter group into the orthogonal group of that bilinear form. And it's a, you know the sense in which these distances are realized is that if I take the product of gamma i and gamma j and look at look at where it goes in the representation, um, that's a hyperbolic element of this group. Um, you know, with translation length, you know, dij. Okay, so it has eigenvalues, whatever, e to the dij, or, or uh, uh, whatever, something like that. Uh, okay, and so how do you make this representation? Well, um, it comes from uh, reflections uh, in a k-simplex. Um, uh, delta, um, yeah. Okay, reflections in a case simplex uh, delta contained in R p k minus one, where the reflections are orthogonal with respect to this bilinear form. Okay, um, great. And I don't want to say uh, I want to get to the uh, the point here. Um, so. <laughs> Originally, Tits and you know generalization of, of his work shows that uh, if you take the orbit of this simplex under this representation, uh, you get some nice convex domain omega in R p k minus one, which generalizes uh, sort of what the union of all of these uh, all of these tiles looks like. It's some in this picture, it would be some convex domain slightly larger than, than H2. OK. Um, here, for now, it's just some convex domain in, in RPK minus 1. So the constraints of the DIJ are faithful? Uh, no. Any DIJ will give you a faithful, discrete representation. Uh, but um, there may be some bad choices of the DIJ which lead to a degenerate bilinear form. But it, it doesn't matter, actually. Um, so we don't want to make those choices, though. Um, yeah, so, so, so it's, you know, I don't know many ways to do this, but this is sort of, you know, God-given parameterized family of discrete faithful representations. Um, it's, I think, kind of a rare occurrence in the world of discrete subgroups of, of Lie groups. OK. Um, OK, so, so uh, uh, right. So now what we want to do is we want to mimic this. We want to use you know, some hyperbolic geometry to measure, uh, to make some, uh, you know, describe some explicit deformations, which are somehow contracting and repeat this argument. Uh, the problem is that the signature of this of this bilinear form is uh, typically not n comma one. It's usually just some pq, and you can sometimes uh, change pq by messing with the the distances dij. Um, but uh, you know, you, you don't have a whole lot of control over what signatures appear here. Um, let me just say it's it's sort of locally constant though the signature. Okay, um, so let's think. So let's let's just uh, you know look at a point where the where the signature is is non degenerate. Um, so we can we can just identify uh, the orthogonal group of B with just standard copy of OPQ. 
And think of this as a, as a family of representations into OPQ. OK, so we need something to play the role of the hyperbolic plane. Um, so let me tell you what that is. Um, I'd like to try to uh, convince you that this is a really interesting geometry to, to study. Um, OPQ acts on what I'll call HPQ minus 1. It's the uh, semi-Ramanian hyperbolic space of signature PQ minus 1. It's just the um, set of points in the in projective space uh, which have zero norm with respect to the, I'm sorry, which have negative, which are negative with respect to this bilinear form. Um, OK, so it, it has constant curvature. Um, it has constant curvature, but you know it, it is semi-Ramanian. So here's a picture, one of my favorite um, uh, homogeneous spaces. This is H21, um, um, also known as the anti de Sitter 3 space. Um, and here there are, you know, there are points that have a positive distance. Uh, points that have negative distance. And in the tangent space of every point, there's sort of a, a null cone um, sort of dividing the directions which are positive in the semi-Ramanian metric uh, from the directions which are, which are negative. Um, OK, but you know, it's really nice. It, has, it shares a lot of properties with the hyperbolic, uh, hyperbolic space. Having a metric like this is like, you know, having one one arm tied tied behind your back. You know, negative distances can be really horrible. Um, okay, but so so just to let me see what I can say. Um, real quickly here. So the basic the, the way we want to try to mimic this argument is, well, we want to define uh, a deformation vector field x. Now, this, you know, it won't, it won't be defined on all of HPQ, or HPQ minus 1. Um, just, on, just on the orbit, um, just on omega. So the this convex domain tiled by these um, by these uh, iterates of delta, okay, and um, you know of course we want it to be equivariant. So we want it to in the same way describe how these uh, how this tiling deforms. Uh, and I claim that we can do this. Uh, you know we can choose. Uh, a sort of one-parameter family path of these parameters, um, uh, so choose an infinite, infinitesimal deformation. It's the same thing. Just take all the parameters to be t, and then you know decrease them. Uh, can choose an infinitesimal deformation, rho zero, uh, comma u. Uh, such that x is contracting. What does that mean? It means positive distance are getting smaller. What should it do to negative distances? I don't know. We can't really control them. So it's just contracting in positive directions. So somehow, a sort of lie, but a heuristic picture is that you know, we have some sort of convex domain here. This is. Omega, it's not really omega. We actually have to cut off some of omega to get it nicely to fit inside here. Um, you know, and then you have some some tiles. Uh, you know, whatever. Uh, uh, okay. Um, and these tiles, uh, if we if we just look out in in positive directions, we see tiles coming towards us. Um, but if we look at the vector field in, in these negative directions, we can't really control what's happening. So that's a problem. Um, 
But the way that that's resolved is that, um, uh, so let me see, let me say a tile, um, you know, one, one tile, like the one I drew here, sees all but finitely many. Uh, tiles uh, in a compact family of space light of sorry positive directions so essentially for the argument that we did where we find the tile that's moving least and define a coarse projection the negative directions don't matter all of the all of the other tiles are seen from this one in just a compact family of positive directions. Okay, and that turns out to be enough to, to get that coarse projection argument to, to work very nicely. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks.